Hello, everyone. Welcome to Silicon Dragon and our online show. Many of you have joined us for many of our shows since we started in April 2020. And I appreciate you signing up with us again today. Today, uh, we are going to be going through uh, another Ask a VC session, and we have a really great guest joining us, which I'll be introducing in a moment. But just a few comments about Silicon Dragon Ventures, if you're joining us for the first time. Uh, we have our newsletter, our blog, our site, our videos, this show, Ask a VC show, our books, and our circle membership. So thank you for your support along the way with all of these things. Uh, now, I mentioned that we do have a unique guest today. He lives and breathes at the intersection of DC and Silicon Valley. A really unique VC with uh, these wonderful connections uh, across capitals. So, hello, Yana, how are you? I think you need to unmute. Sometimes it's better not to hear me, it happens. Uh, but <laughs> Rebecca, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Uh, you're very welcome and uh, we're very happy to have you here. So let me just say a few words about Yanov. He, um, he's the first VC we've had on the show who lived in Puerto Rico. <laughs> and uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. But he's, of course, lived in D.C. and he's been very active on Sand Hill Road. He has great connections into the Sand Hill Road community. He was an investor at NEA, the biggest D.C. private equity firm uh, in the States. He was a former White House investment officer in the Bush and the, and the Obama administration. And I love this quote from him. The public sector has been influencing success in the Valley forever. Today, I saw that Bloomberg had a report on Google uh, courting the wow. Pentagon. So that was really interesting timing. Now, I don't think anyone has a better academic record than Yana. Uh, Yale University, Harvard Law School, Oxford, uh, Sydney Law School. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, when did you have time to even do anything else but study? I know, right? The bigger question is, when did I get to finally pay off my debt, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe DC helped that. I don't know. He's originally from New York City, resides in Puerto Rico, as I said, and he's a world traveler, 164 countries. Wow. Which countries haven't you been to, Yana? Still traveling. Always more to see. Always more to see. Have you been everywhere in the Caribbean? Uh, the, I will have been after uh, Christmas, actually. I'm going there this Christmas to finish it off. Okay, what, Cuba or something? No, been to Cuba. I'm going to Dominica, St. Kitts, and St. Lucia. Oh, very good. Very yeah. good. Have you been to China? China, yes, many times. Many times. Okay. Yeah, there's so much to see. Yeah, what was your favorite part of your China travels? Um, I went to this great little place called um, Zhu Zhaigao, which a lot of people don't know about. It's a national park uh, kind of in the middle of the country, and it's just beautiful, like amazing scenery, pristine waterfalls. It's fantastic. Okay. Well, what led you to China in the first place? Just the curiosity, adventure? Oh, I've always loved to travel. I think travel really centers you. It makes you really grateful for what you have. It exposes you to new ideas. Um, so for me, that's a, a key element of, of my life. So there's always a new place. Whenever you go somewhere, you meet people who've been somewhere else and you add it to your list, right? Uh, absolutely. Where have you been spending your time during COVID? Uh, during COVID, well, I live in Puerto Rico, as you know. Uh, during COVID, the year before that, I was bouncing around a lot. I was in uh, French Polynesia. In I spent some time in Hilton Head. I spent some time in New York. I spent some time in uh, St. Vincent. So some time in the Caribbean Bahamas. It was great. I mean, it was not great that people were getting sick, but I was having a lot of time uh, to myself in beautiful locations. Okay. So before we launch into your venture capital career, I I'd love to hear a little bit more. What is it like living in Puerto Rico? Because we, we, you know, we get all these news reports here on the mainland. Uh, what's it like really being there? Do you know, it's pretty fantastic. Um, I work a lot when I'm down here as I do everywhere. Um, 
But being, uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurs down here. A lot of the Bitcoin folks came down here. Um, a lot of finance investment people. So there's some VCs down here. So it really is like a small mini Silicon Valley ecosystem. It's nice. Is it all centered around San Juan or where? Uh, so I live in San Juan, most of it's centered in San Juan. And then there's a few kind of suburbs of San Juan that people with, you know, big families tend to live. Right. Are things kind of getting back to normal there in Puerto Rico after the storms and the, the financial problems? Yeah, things are pretty much back to normal. Um, there's still broken glass in some windows here and there, but everybody's functioning. And it's actually the most vaccinated place in the country. So that's pretty great, too. Oh, it is. What's the percentage? I think it's uh, over 70% now. Okay, of the double, I guess. Yeah, it's doing great. Okay, well, good, good. Well, let's learn a little bit more about Yana and his firm. Uh, so you launched this in 2015, and Fund 1 was 2015, Fund 2 was 2019, and you have been investing in about 12, about a dozen deals per fund. And uh, your focus is really on these new technologies across commercial and public sectors. And I think that that's really unique in the venture world. Somebody who's lived and worked in DC and knows that, and also knows the Sand Hill Road part of it and the technology part of it. Uh, so I'd like, really like to talk a little bit of what the, is your view of what is it like today as an investor in the VC world? What do you see as a major trend happening? And we'll just start there. So it depends what you're thinking about. So in the investment world, in the startup world in particular, I think some of the most exciting trends are in um, some of the byproducts actually of the COVID scenario. So things like supply chain. Um, fraud, uh, infrastructure technologies. Those to me, I think are the most interesting right now. We invest in enterprise tech at SineWave. So for us, it's really the harder core tech that we're focused on. So in that right. space, I think those are the interesting areas. Right, but in terms of valuation, what, what's your view of the valuations that you're seeing? Because I know it, in a number of your deals, like for instance, Rescale, and Databricks, they have Databricks in particular has this huge valuation of 38 billion. What's happening there? Well, for us, great things. It depends when you're investing. <laughs> you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, hopefully that'll go away. <laughs> Databricks has substantial revenue to a billion dollars in revenue. So there's some justification. How justification is that, Rebecca, better? Evaluation. I hope so. Yeah, it's better. All right, I'll try from here. And if not, I'll switch uh, to the connection to make You'll it a little easier. You'll switch to me. Is this, is this a Puerto Rico uh, thing? Or yeah, it's Puerto Rico. Yeah, it's Puerto Rico. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. It could be. It depends on if it's raining outside or not. But it's great to, uh, oh, I'll come back on if it happens again. Um, oh, I so, see. Yeah, so uh, it's not, it's not I'm like in India, where the power just goes off, you know, in the middle of the night, totally unexpectedly, at least it used to, maybe not so bad anymore. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. Go it ahead. <laughs> happens. So on the valuation front, um, you know, I think that the valuations are getting out of whack at the later stages. Some of that is because of the investors that you have coming in to deals nowadays, right? So you have these later stage investors or even public markets investors or families who have historically um, not invested in venture. And so I call them kind of dumb money. They're actually very smart people, but when it comes to venture, they're not the swiftest. And so, or it's not their industry, right? Um, it's much more about building companies, understanding technologies, understanding markets. So from that perspective, I think it's quite important uh, for folks to focus on where is the real value in a company, right? And at what stage? So we do early stage because we think where that, that's where that comes from. But at the end of the day, it's really about having the discipline to invest at smart valuations because what people forget is that, you know, venture is a 10 year game in most cases for each startup. And so what's the reality now is not necessarily going to be the reality in 10 years. And if valuations start to come down, which they always do at some point, uh, you need to make sure you can keep the startup functioning and alive, right? Right, 
Right. Well, it, it looks like you have done that. One of your deals had its back uh, last year, or actually it's this year. I'm already thinking that this is last year, even though we're still in this year, right? Um, Databricks is coming up maybe to an IPO next year, you think? I can't say for sure because I'm not allowed, but it looks like that if you read the press. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and then... Uh, of course, uh, your cybersecurity firm, Sentinel One, had a huge IPO on the New York Stock Exchange in 2021, $15 billion IPO. And um, what, what's so special about Sentinel One? So Sentinel One is a really unique case. Uh, at SineWave, uh, cybersecurity is one of our specialty areas. Uh, obviously, on the enterprise side, that's a big deal. Um, and our thesis there is, you know, you can't just tell someone there's a problem, you need to really solve the problem and solve that for any kind of infrastructure or organization. So Sentinel One, what they do and what we noticed early on is that they make it so it actually doesn't matter what kind of attack it is. All they, instead of focusing on, is it ransomware? Is it a bot? Is it, what is it? Instead, they focus on whatever's in your system, what is it doing that is abnormal, right? So most attacks have a profile and Sentinel makes the effort to make sure that any of those characteristics of an attack profile are protected against at your organization. So it recognizes those profiles and then it prevents those, and it prevents whatever's making the attack from doing harm to your system. So it's a much less about, you know, the whack-a-mole finding the bad guy and more about, well, this is how things are supposed to go. Let's recognize the bad guy, understand they're going to come in anyway, but prevent them from hurting your, your, your company once they're in. I see. I see. Okay. And did you co-invest uh, on that deal or lead that deal? So we were in the series B, like boy, of that deal a long time ago. Um, and uh, we, we found the deal, sourced the deal. I forget if we led that round, it's possible. Um, but at SignWave, what we do is we lead all of our deals from the perspective of sourcing, sitting on the board as a observer, as a board advisor, um, but whoever runs the docs, we don't often care. Uh, but so for Sentinel, we were in there early. Okay. Yeah, and it's interesting that you've sourced some of these deals from the CIA and the Department of Defense. Uh, Sentinel One was from the Department of Defense. Can you tell us a little bit about what that sourcing is like? What, what's involved with that? How do, how do you find out about these things? And I uh, mean, you go out to lunch with somebody and they, you know, stop, start talking about what they're doing or how, how does this happen? Well, so sine wave uh, is, uh, so the thesis at sine wave is that tech is important to the Cisco and Googles of the world, but it's also important to all the other companies in the world. Uh, and so that's your Fortune 500. And it's also your public sector folks, right? So, which is just another Fortune 500 in our mind. And so from that perspective, we create a thesis. Uh, and in our case, we had this thesis about the bad guy's going to get in anyway. So how do you prevent him from causing harm or him or her from causing harm? Right. And then we went out to our networks, which are broader than the typical Valley network, or they're different is maybe more diverse and different than a typical venture network. And we'll tell them, hey, we're thinking about this. What are you seeing? What are you, what are you noticing? What are your theses? Does it match with ours? And we did that with a friend of ours who was the CTO at the Department of Defense. And he said, well, if you believe in that thesis, you've got to check out this company. And so that's how we found Sentinel One. Oh, I see. OK. And you did another deal through the CIA. That's the Databricks deal. Yeah, that was an interesting one. <laughs> Sometimes people think the CIA is scary. Uh, but yeah. with, uh, with Databricks, when it comes to tech, you know, we don't opine on the mission stuff. We opine on the technical infrastructure, right? So okay. with Databricks, um, they were, the company was trying to do a deal with the CIA, like, you know, sell their technology as a customer. And the CIA wanted to be a customer, um, but they actually weren't communicating well with each other because they had, you know, the two entities speak different languages. I always say, you know, in the Valley, it's all about what it can be and the dream and the future and, and what you're going to build eventually, right? But when right. you're talking to the public sector or quite frankly, any enterprise big customer, you want to talk about what is and what you could do now and what you can reliably perform at the current time, right? Because they're going to put you in their current business model. And so 
Uh, anyway, the CIA said talk to Sinewave. The investors in Databricks at the time said talk and si talk to Sinewave, and so we were one of the only early stage VCs in the deal. It was us um, and Reese and Horowitz, which folks probably know, yeah. and uh, and NEA, my old shop. I see. So Databricks must be do must do something around data. Yes. So Databricks. So we're big believers in open source. Um, you may remember those who are particularly technical. Hadoop used to be the way people did data analytics way back when. It still is out there, right? And still relevant. Um, but real-time analytics came from an open source platform called Spark. And Spark is, is what Databricks is built upon. So the team that invented the open source platform Spark for real-time analytics invented the enterprise software on top of Spark, which is Databricks. And now it's really mainstream. Every major company out there uses Databricks for its um, for its enterprise uh, data analytics. Okay, uh, good. And uh, I guess everyone got a good tip on this show uh, if they were listening about Databricks, uh, but not from Anna. That was from me. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, now, when we did a prep about this uh, a week or so ago, we had a, a prep session where we kind of reviewed the content. And, and one of the things that uh, stood out in my mind is you said uh, that when you invest in companies, particularly startups, they, they can get an edge uh, with your venture know-how and value add because you have these connections to DC and you could get maybe contracts that they wouldn't be able to get or help them get contracts that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise and then grow faster. Can you talk about that? Yeah, actually, why don't we use Databricks as an example? Because it's okay. actually one that totally applies. So um, when Databricks goes public, you may notice that um, one of their three biggest verticals or their three focus verticals, one is industrial, another is healthcare, and the third is public sector. And okay. it turns out that the average VC doesn't know much about public sector. And so when you're working with a company like Databricks, and it's going to be a massive company, you could just have the healthcare and industrial, which we happen to know too at SineWave. But if you can add that big cherry on top, it has particular value for a startup, right? And so with Databricks, what we did is we actually, it's a funny story, we actually told them not to talk to the CIA in the end, and instead said, you should talk to the Department of Defense. And so they ended up going, uh, getting compatible with Microsoft, which we helped them a bit with. And then we've helped open doors for them at the different public sector agencies so that they could get customers there. Similarly with Rescale, our company that you talked about earlier, right? We're building out their public sector business. And the cool thing about it is the public sector is a great stamp of approval. And it's also, because it's the biggest scale you could possibly imagine for an enterprise company. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, it's also much more than just the government, right? The public sector, most people I think think Department of Defense, CIA, but so is Amazon and Google and Microsoft. They're all big, big public sector customers. By the way, Facebook is even. And so is IBM and AT&T and SpaceX and Palantir and, and even now, you know, Monsanto and... Okay, you're, you're breaking up a little bit while, uh, while you get that straight. Yeah. And, and Pfizer, you name it. So it, it, it's a nice ability to come so that you're not, as, while you're doing that, I'm going to- I'm going to take a look at the, at the questions here. Um, and I'm going to read them out loud while, while we're straightening that out. That so uh, Rebecca Frankel, who I know. I, I Rebecca, another Rebecca. Um, has your firm made any investments in the digital health space? specifically virtual human clinicians with very advanced natural language dialogue? Okay, well, that's a very specific question. Uh, and then another question here is from Hal Kalman. Uh, what companies do you like in security and AI? Uh, do you work with Palantir on any deals? They have contracts across the 21 NSA, no such agencies of the federal government that I know of. Okay. Uh, so, uh, which one would you like to take first? Yeah, no. let's take the, uh, let's take the, give me one second just to make this perfect. And then I'll take the healthcare one. Okay. Um, we'll take the healthcare one. Okay. And then I'm going to look yeah. at the chat and see who's here in chat who has something to say. 
Um, and then anyone who has a question or just wants to comment, you know, you could just do what Rebecca or Hal just did and type in to the Q&A box here. And uh, I'll be sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, nice to see you too, Rebecca. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, it's been way too long. So, okay. Uh, now, uh, Hal Kelman is one of our regulars on the show. He always has great questions. So I'm looking forward to uh, what he has to uh, offer this time around. Uh, Rebecca Frankel saying her newest company is orangetherapeutics.com. So we know we know her question has a little bit of an angle to it. <laughs> uh, good for you, Rebecca. Um, this is what more entrepreneurs should be doing on the show: is connecting directly to the VC. Um, okay, so we're happy. We're happy that we're all here. Um, and uh, you know what? Um, I'm going to share a little bit about what we have coming up too, so all of you can get prepared for that. Um, our next show is going to be with. Andrew Tung of 1955 Capital. And Andrew Tung is very experienced VC in Silicon Valley, China tech, early stage tech, particularly in the sustainability area. He also started up his own firm, 1955 Capital, and he's been at Coast Flow Ventures and also Lightspeed. So we're going to have him on November 18th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And then we're going in. January, early January, you know, Consumer Electronics Show is coming on, but uh, January 6th, um, in the late afternoon, we'll have a show with a number of speakers, including HPC, China President, uh, and we're going to be talking a lot about all these new uh, metaverse and VR and crypto. It's going to be really interesting. So I would encourage you to sign up for that early, Silicon Dragon CES 2022, and you can sign up there. And now we're going to go back to Yana and uh, check out uh, your answer to Rebecca's question here. Yeah, thank you all for being patient with me. I apologize for that. Um, but, okay. uh, but let me fill you guys in on the answers. So uh, I'll take the digital health question first, Rebecca, and then we'll go in order. I see them in front of me. So okay. on the digital health side of things, um, you know, we have invested in companies that work in the healthcare space, but we prefer to think of healthcare. So one, I should say we do services on the healthcare side. So technology and enterprise technology as it applies to healthcare. Um, so that is where digital health comes in, but not in spaces where you work in the medical field in a very, you know, in a way that you would have to be a doctor or a medical professional to understand the technology. Um, and then the other way to put it is, I think that health is one of many verticals of exciting tech, right? So we actually have a company that uses data analytics to help with uh, neuroimaging uh, and radiology. We also have a company called, in fact, Rescale, which Rebecca mentioned earlier, Rescale, actually, what they do is they were actually helpful in um, sequencing the COVID genome, sequencing COVID um, for the drug companies. And that's because they're a high performance computing company. So I think of healthcare as fitting within those spaces for us. Um, and then another question we got um, from Harold was what companies do we like in security and AI? Um, and do we work with Palantir in any deals? So on the security and AI front, um, it's funny, I do think AI is a bit of a buzzword nowadays. Um, uh, we look for when it's really artificial intelligence rather than just advanced data analytics. Um, security, you guys know what we love because we're in Sentinel-1, um, but we're also looking at some new types of security companies. One of them is a company called Shard Secure, which is an early investment of ours. Um, we're also, uh, we also have an investment in a company called Shift Left, which is about application security. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are some examples in the security space. In the AI space, um, we're in a great company called Paperspace. We just did a great deal in a company called Selector. Um, and so I think those are some great examples. Um, and then uh, on Palantir, you know, Palantir, a lot of its business is still selling to the public sector. And at SineWave, we really look for companies that sell to commercial first and foremost. 
Now, Palantir has expanded its commercial business, as you guys know, um, but they don't tend to be, a, one, they have amazing engineers, so they don't really need to buy a lot of enterprise tech because they build it themselves. And two, as a partner to the government, you're more likely to want to partner with um, a Microsoft or an Amazon or an IBM or a, maybe a, a, a Lidos or a Lockheed because of the way they're structured. Very little about Palantir as a company, but because of the way they're structured. Okay. So uh, while we're uh, talking about uh, or taking into these questions, uh, let's go to Hal's question. Can you remind me Hal's question? Yes, okay. Hal's question. <laughs> Putting you on the spot, Hal. Uh, what companies do you like in security and AI? Oh, that was the one I just covered. I called him Harold because his official name is Harold. Right. Did he, <laughs> I, did, yeah, okay. But are there any specific companies? Oh, yeah. So in security, as I mentioned, we love a company called Shard Secure and a company called Shift Left. And in AI, um, a company called Paperspace and a company called, I mentioned a company called Selector that we really love. So those are some examples of the ones we like. Uh, okay, okay. And then what is it like working with Palantir on deals? So, you know, Pal the way Palantir works with the government is they are a data analytics platform to some extent, right? An intelligence platform for companies and for the government. So they work directly. We don't work so much with Palantir. They've been customers for some of our startups, but what we're doing at SineWave is helping our startups sell to the public sector or sell to other corporates. And so it's, it's usually better to partner with one of the infrastructure players who sell the, the base infrastructure that right. our startup will provide the software on top of. And okay. Palantir tends to do all that themselves. Okay. So now do you also still do, uh, you worked at NEA for a number of years and yes. were you based in DC then? Yes, I lived in DC when I was with NEA and then traveled a lot to the Valley. You know, the Valley is the mothership. So we're always there. <laughs> well, right, right. But I think NEA, didn't they start in Baltimore? They were both coasts. They started in Silicon Valley and Baltimore at the same time. Yep. I see. I see. And do you uh, work, do you do deals with NEA, share deal flow with them? Bring them in? Yeah, on, so, do they bring you in and then you bring them in? Yeah. So VCs do tend to share deals. It is um, yeah. still very much a a club, unfortunately, although it is much more diverse than it was before. Uh, I'm sure, Rebecca, given your background, you're, you've seen some integration of new folks into the venture landscape. Um, sure. And so uh, we do do deals with one another. NEA is still um, uh, Peter Barris, who was the managing partner at NEA for many years, is still on my board, uh, my advisory board. And NEA, we're in Databricks together. And actually, speaking of AI, to Hal's question, we just did a great company together with NEA as well. We both did the round together called Clarify, um, which ends in an AI instead of a Y. Also an AI platform that's really growing very, very quickly. I see, I see. Uh, how many boards are you on? Well, we share the boards across the partnership. So it's not just me. I would say we, at the earlier stages, we're on about each partner is on about five or so boards. Um, and the reason it's a lot less than I bet some of the other VCs on your show, Rebecca, may have said is because uh, we have a very concentrated portfolio. So at SineWave, we're much more thesis driven. And so we believe that there's only a few versions of the world that we think will be the future. And so when we decide our version in each sector, we invest in one company in that space. And so our funds, we only have about 12 to 15 deals per fund, whereas someone like an NEA, which is a different model, and they're good at their model, they'll do a few hundred deals a fund, right? So they have a lot more boards than we do at the end of the day. Right, right. How does somebody get on your radar? An so entrepreneur, how, yeah, how does an entrepreneur get on your radar? So deals typically come for, in three directions to a VC. Um, and of course, there's always exceptions, right? So one is a proactive, you know, um, where we go hunting, we call it. So we'll go and find the, the startup that matches our thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is that a fellow VC brings it to us. And then the third way is through our, through our entrepreneurs and through our customers and partners. So if you're an entrepreneur on the show, 
listening to the show, what I would recommend if you're trying to get in touch with the VC is a few things. So first I would say other VCs, that's a great way because then they could speak to how great what you're doing is. Okay. And then how- And then a second thing I would do is use your relationships, use entrepreneurs you've worked with. Okay. Have you ever had a deal that's gone astray, just totally wacko deal <laughs> that didn't work out? Um, we've had a lot of deal. They don't always go wacko. I've seen some in other firms, <laughs> but um, <laughs> what tends to happen is that the deal, um, usually what I see the most when a deal struggles is that it's a very technical deal that is founded by technical folks um, and they have trouble translating technology into a product, right? Because they're not, the perfect technology is not always the perfect product, right? And so getting it right for the customers versus getting it right for kind of a technologist can sometimes be difficult. Um, and so you have to be able to think about that as you scale. Right. Now, I understand that you help rescale to transition its business model. Can you talk about that? Yeah, interestingly, Rescale in the early days, um, well, still today, they're a big high performance computing company. That's what Rescale does. And so at the end of the day with Rescale, high performance computing is, is that term is now gaining popularity, but early on, not a lot of people knew what it was. I, I bet a lot of the entrepreneurs on your show um, and on the call today are developing things that are so new that not everybody knows the term or knows what it does. Right. And so with Rescale, we had to do some translating early on. So yes, they do high performance computing, but they also can enable simulation. They can also do an advanced type of data analytics and compute for you. So it's sometimes you pitch things a bit differently in order to appeal to the customer. Sentinel One is actually another great example, uh, which you mentioned earlier, Rebecca. Sentinel One actually got in very early on as as playing as a um, antivirus technology. Okay, um, it was not really their their bailiwick, but that's what sold and was understood by customers. And then they eventually were able to show, hey, this is an endpoint technology, which is now very well accepted by the industry. I see. All right. Uh, so talking about the size of venture capital funds today, they've gotten larger and larger and the deal sizes have gotten larger and larger and the IPOs have gotten larger and larger. Uh, is there an end inside to that? And what's your view of these mega funds? Uh, do those actually produce good results? Um, so I do think the deal sizes are getting larger and larger. Um, I think that's actually a trend. Um, I attribute it to Andreessen. Everybody attributes it to something else. Um, but some of it's the big guys coming in earlier. Um, and some of it's, you know, Andreessen's model, I think, although they probably wouldn't say this, is putting a lot of money in any company at any value. And if you have one Facebook, that's what matters, right? right. Um, and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't um, for certain. But at the end of the day, it's really about your LPs. LPs are the folks who invest in the fund, right? And so some LPs are looking to just deploy money and get a... 15% return like anything else. And maybe one year they'll get a Facebook. Um, and others are looking for a pretty consistent 30, 40, 50% return. I think it's very hard when you're putting that much money into deals at crazy prices to get that kind of return. Right, right. So th the size of your funds are about, tell us. Oh, yes. So our each of our funds in, in fund one and fund two are about $55 million. Mm -hmm. And then we also do direct investing in the same companies on top of that. So I we see. manage about 80, 90 million a fund. Um, and our next fund, which is coming eventually, uh, probably sometime next year, will be a little bit bigger, but around the same size. Okay. And will you be changing any focus at all with that fund? Because I know you have this a vertical stack thesis, which you can explain to us what that means exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So from a thesis perspective, in terms of tech applying to lots of new different companies and new areas beyond the valley, beyond only the valley, that part mm -hmm. of the fund will stay the same from a thesis perspective. Um, but in terms of where, how the thesis is evolving, you know, I mentioned some of the new sectors earlier that we're interested in, like supply chain, like fraud management. Um, 
a lot of the open source tech we love. Um, but another thing we're seeing is typically VCs like to invest in platforms and platforms are like a Sentinel One where any company needs cybersecurity, right? But we were also seeing the emergence of uh, technology that can apply to an entire, um, to a entire vertical up and down the stack, right? So you can now have an ag tech company up and down the stack, right? That really is the tech solution for the agriculture industry. So that's a different way of approaching a market than something like Sentinel. And I think just as big of a way. That's always been the case in healthcare per one of the other questions we got earlier. There's always mm -hmm. been healthcare only companies. Mm -hmm. But I think there's be very companies in areas can look at that. Right, yeah, we did have this question about, uh, also about, do you see opportunities in the medical education field using VR and AR because that certainly is hot now, VR and AR and the metaverse. So what about this area, medical education field using VR and AR? You know, we don't do a ton in the education space, so I don't have a, a, a ton to say on it, but I do think that VR and AR are interesting approaches to the future of, of tech and to providing services. Mm -hmm. I do think they're pretty early still though. Um, I think you're more likely to see in the nearer term stuff like um, telemedicine um, as a better example of the use of technology for providing health service uh, rather than necessarily the Oculus type things of the world. Although that's coming, it's certainly coming. Right, right. So metaverse, uh, have you done any metaverse or crypto deals? Um, uh, so crypto, no. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a different perspective on crypto in that I don't think it lasts um, very long. I, I get I think it will morph into something different. Um, and uh -huh. I think the decentralization and the um, the anonymity will be gone. In fact, the anonymity is already gone. If you read the infrastructure bill carefully, they're actually regulating crypto now. Um, it was hidden in the bill. Um, and so I do think that that will change. So we haven't done crypto investments, but we do love the blockchain. So I think that blockchain will be an interesting, exciting space, but not for everything, right? It, you have to identify what are the real great use cases that solve the problem that is really being experienced that blockchain addresses. And so blockchain is great at, for example, secure contracts. It's great at um, logistics and tracking know your customer type of things and tracking um, compliance. So, so blockchain has specific use cases that I think are most apt um, and others where it'll just be a toy and not be as effective. Okay, so crypto is about to be regulated? Crypto is already regulated, yes. But in um, the new infrastructure bill you just mentioned. Yeah, the infrastructure bill now requires that all crypto transactions be reported um, and non, there won't be anonymity in the way that it's supposed to, that some of the uh, crypto see. enthusiasts believe would, would work. Because at I the see. end of the day, you're dealing with currency and governments aren't gonna let uh, that go anonymous and decentralized, it's just not gonna happen. But it'll take time and there's still exciting things and there will be cryptocurrency, but it will just be very different than I think what most people are excited about today. Right, and what's your view of, well, we heard a lot about remote working and Silicon Valley is no longer the pinnacle and uh, Silicon Valley is decentralized. Uh, what's your view? You're sitting there in Puerto Rico. You must have a different perspective on it. Yeah, I do think that, uh, look, technologists have always been decentralized. It's our business. We're used to things like Zoom, usually with better connection than I had on this call, but we're <laughs> used to it. Um, but um, in terms of what I think the future of that is, I think that you will see, I, I believe that memories are short. So we will be going back to the office soon and not everything will be as it was in the past few years or maybe in the next year or two. Um, you learn that when you spent enough time in the political world that memories are very short. Um, but on the work front, I do think we will work remotely, um, but not to the degree that everybody thinks. The reason is, if, you're, if you know the Valley, the most difficult thing for big companies and startups in the Valley is retaining talent, right? And when you're remote and some of the younger generation, the only folks they know at their work, they know as a computer screen, right? It's very easy to switch. 
So you see, it's a great time to be looking for jobs because everybody's moving around. And if you can't, it's hard enough to retain talent in person, but when you lose that personal connection, it makes it even more difficult. So I think that that um, will ultimately be the driver of companies forcing people back into the office. They're just all waiting to see who's going to do it first. And then they can blame that one and all follow, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. What, what about in your firm? You, uh, everybody is remote? Yeah, we've always been remote. We have an office from the beginning in Silicon Valley. We have folks who, who work all over the place. Uh, we've always been that way, and it's always worked seamlessly. So that's Besides you thing. in Puerto Rico, do you have anyone uh, outside, kind of outside the mainland U.S.? No, we don't have anyone internationally. Uh, most of what we focus on as a firm is the domestic market. Uh, we do source deals that are international from friends in our networks, but as a team, our deals are our deals are primarily focused on the U.S. market first, and then expanding to the international market. Expanding to the international market. So, what's your view of China as an expansion market? Um, I think that China is a very difficult one if you don't really, really know what you're doing. Uh, funny enough, someone was just talking to me yesterday, Rebecca, about a firm that they're invest they want to invest in a VC fund in China. And I said, well, I hope those VC people know which entrepreneurs have family members on the Politburo because that can change the entire trajectory of a tech company in that country. Um, but it's a, certainly an amazing market and exciting space and you, you can't get bigger scale than China, right? So if you know how to do it, it's a huge opportunity, but that's not something we have expertise in at Simon. Okay. So you worked in the White House as a chief investment official. Now, what was that like? What did you do and what was it like? Yeah, so we weren't actually in the White House, but we reported to the White House. And it was really exciting. <laughs> I, I tend to joke um, in the Bush administration. And by the way, I love both of the presidents. So I'm not making a, a, a judgment call on them here. But in the Bush administration, you couldn't okay. get you couldn't get much done uh, no matter how important. And in the Obama administration, you couldn't get much done more irresponsibly in terms of speed and diligence. So, um, you know, they both have their poison. Okay. <laughs> so uh, where did you work then? I mean, I mean how did, what, what did you do there? What was your day like? What did you yeah, do? So, what so were your responsibilities? The our, our job, my group's job was to invest in companies that were innovative and had great new tech, but were not yet commercialized. So we would help by investing, literally direct investing in the companies through debt and other mechanisms, help them grow their companies. And some were small, like series B startups, and some were big corporates, like multi-billion dollar financings, right? Mm -hmm. But always new tech. And that's actually why um, one of the major reasons that dr drove some of the thesis at SineWaves is that so many, v so many VCs and entrepreneurs wanted that money from the government, right? To buffer and grow their business even bigger. And so that's where the thesis, you know, some of that experience that I had is where our thesis at SineWave came from. Yeah, that really gives you a leg up on deal sourcing and deals and investment flow and, and all that, I would think. And helping the companies that you're investing in to scale up with these uh, contracts, government contracts. And yeah, well, I imagine, it's nice. Go ahead, Rebecca. No, and I imagine you keep your contacts pretty live. We do. You know, the everyone thinks the politicals matter, um, but the politicals don't matter as much. It's really the people who are doing the day-to-day -day operations and business and technology of the government. Those are the ones who you want to focus on, and those don't change every few years. Okay. Um, and so it's a nice advantage because we don't have to compete with the other big venture funds, right? Because we have a unique value to the startup. We come in alongside or we bring yeah. in the other big venture funds. So it's a nice yeah. advantage. Sure. Um, that's good. Now, uh, does anyone else have another question? Because I kind of have monopolized the questions. <laughs> But so someone else. Um, so Yana, do you have anything you would like to add? No, you know, if there are any entrepreneurs out there who are interested in scaling their enterprise business, feel free to reach out. Um, we, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, SineWave is SineWave.vc, and we'd love to talk to you and keep listening to Rebecca's podcast. I think she's fantastic. And hopefully these insights were a little bit different and informative, and I'm sure there'll be more from her guests to come. 
Okay, very good. Thank you so much. And uh, let me just share screen again uh, while we move along. Uh, as I mentioned, we have our CES show coming up. And some of you have already joined our circle membership, so thank you for that. And some of you have read my books. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, there's a new one coming up. I'd also like to thank Invest Hong Kong for their support for this series. Uh, we did have an Invest Hong Kong person on the on the Zoom, but uh, she didn't ask anything. So, uh, and we didn't we covered China a little bit, but we didn't really cover Hong Kong. Um, so, uh, would you do a deal in Hong Kong, Yana? Um, again, we really focus on the U.S. because I don't understand the dynamics down there okay. myself. Yet. That's yeah. fair enough. That's definitely fair enough. So thank you everyone for joining us and let's give Yana a round of applause. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you being there and uh, hopefully your storm will go away soon and uh, we'll hopefully meet you in person too in some, someday, maybe New York or Puerto Rico or Silicon Valley. Uh, so thanks again and uh, see you next time. Thanks, Bye Rebecca. Now. Have yeah. a great day. All right. Thank you. Bye everyone.